I'm going to start by talking about our current treatment uh, algorithm uh, for management of ACL injuries in children and adolescents. Uh, and in this session, what we'll do is I'll talk about our cur current treatment algorithm. Um, Martha Murray is going to talk about uh, repair of the ACL instead of reconstruction of the ACL. So that's going to be the future treatment, uh, hopefully the future treatment algorithm, and avoiding some of the problems we have with our current treatments. Uh, next, we're going to have Greg Meyer, who's one of our collaborators uh, from University of Cincinnati, and he's done yeoman's work in the prevention of ACL injuries. Uh, talk about prevention programs and the data behind prevention programs. Uh, and then we're going to have Carl Gustafson, physical therapist, um, give a demonstration about ACL prevention. So I think these four talks tie together very well. I would say that personally this is of great interest to me, um, not only as an ACL surgeon, but uh, um, as a husband of a wife who is one of nine women, uh, nine sisters, and they have 16 ACL tears among those nine sisters. Uh, who are all ski racers, and the father of five kids who are skiing and, and doing other high-risk sports as well, and probably of interest to, to you also. Uh, so these are my disclosures. I think there's no conflicts uh, specifically with this talk. I think we all know, uh, you know, tonight when we watch football, we'll all know uh, and probably have the diagnosis by halftime when a major athlete goes down with a knee injury. And the issue is we're seeing these injuries in younger and younger patients. So the middle school girls team on the left can look forward to growing up, becoming a high school team, and nearly half of these girls have torn their ACL. And this is a hot topic for those of us in the room, so for physicians, surgeons, uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists, coaches, uh, and parents. Um, but it's also become a hot topic in the lay press. So this was the front page of the New York Times uh, with an article on a big-time injury striking little players' knees. This was a patient of ours from Texas. Uh, front page of the San, San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, growing pains, children's sports injuries get worse. Um, this just came out uh, in the Chicago Tribune um, last month, so in August. A career-ending injury at age 11, another one of our patients uh, who had torn their ACL. Uh, and this last year was in the ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, an 8-year-old patient of ours from Maine, uh, who tore his ACL and, and got to meet Tom Brady. So incentive to tear your ACL. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Stein mentioned that youth sports has changed. So certainly kids are playing with less free play at higher intensities, higher competitive levels, focusing on a single sport, lots of involvement of adults, parents, coaches, scouts, and youth sports, you know, we know has become a big business. But we need to remember the benefits of youth exercise. So medically, we've talked about obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular health, bone health, and probably even more important are the psychosocial benefits of participating in youth sports. So higher self-esteem, lower rates of dangerous behavior, and higher career success later in life. So really, for those of us in this room, the question is how can we get these benefits while trying to avoid these injuries, and that's why we're here. I think to talk about ACL injuries in younger patients is really a change in approach. I would say, uh, you know, in the 80s and even when I was training in the early 90s, um, we didn't think kids got ACL injuries. They got other types of injuries, usually fractures or growth plate injuries. Uh, and this was a textbook by uh, uh, Jack Kennedy uh, on the injured uh, adolescent knee, uh, which is a great textbook, um, but doesn't talk much about ACL injuries. There's a fracture of the growth plate and a kid falling off the bike. We were encouraged to update this book, which we did, uh, and much of this uh, relates to ACL injuries. I think there is some controversy with respect to management of ACL injuries in younger patients about the initial treatment, whether it should be operative or non-operative, and what the surgical technique should be uh, with respect to growth plates. And we'll go over some of those concepts here in this talk um, to lay the ground for the next three talks as well. So one option when you tear your ACL is non-operative treatment. And so you say you've torn your ACL, you're still growing, we're going to treat you with rehab bracing, try to keep you out of high-risk sports, and then reconstruct your ACL when you're older, when you're skeletally mature. Uh, and in this country, the results of that have been fairly poor. There are high rates of knee instability, uh, further meniscal tears or articular cartilage, and we're concerned about that in terms of the long-term health of the knee. I would highlight the work by Hovard Moxness. So this is Hovard, uh, his picture here. I was just uh, in Oslo uh, for his PhD defense, uh, and he's a student of Dr. Engebretsen's. And he and Dr. Engebretsen have done um, some very interesting work in this area with non-operative treatment of complete tears in children. Um, they published a study uh, in 2008 
uh, where they looked at a group of 21 non-operative children versus seven operative children, and they found that the non-operative children were able to maintain a certain activity level. About half of them were copers, and about 10% went on to tear their meniscus. They further and just recently published a prospective cohort study on 46 children with two-year follow-up. 22% of them had to go on to ACL reconstruction. Over 90% were involved in pivoting activities, but 38% of them decreased their activity level, and it's not clear if it was from the injury or other reasons. And then just last month in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, they published a prospective cohort of 40 children. Average age was 11 with four-year follow-up. Majority of these kids returned to pivoting sports. 28% of them had meniscal tears. At the time of two different MRI scans, they found 19.5% of them developed new meniscal tears, and 33% went on to surgery. So perhaps some of these children can be copers uh, and don't need ACL reconstruction, but many will, and many will go on to tear their meniscus, which is concerning also. What about partial tears of the ACL? I think we see more partial tears of the ACL in children than we do in adults. In adults, partial tears are usually functionally complete tears. We published this study where we prospectively looked at 45 children who had a partial tear of their ACL. We treated them without reconstruction, followed them forward in time to see who went on to need a reconstruction because of instability or further injury. And we found that 31% of these 45 children went on to require reconstruction. When we looked at risk factors, we found that those patients that were older, the 15 to 18-year-olds, did less well than those children that were younger, the 9 to 14-year-olds. Uh, we found that those children that had a greater percentage tear, so over 50% tear, did less well than those that had a lower percentage of the ACL torn, less than 50%. And we found that those tears that predominantly involved the posterior lateral bundle of the ACL did less well than those that involved the anterior medial bundle. The problem with all the literature uh, for ACLs is that these are relatively large, uh, small series that are retrospective, and we don't talk much about the amount of growth remaining. We often report patients by their chronological age, and I think it's very important to think beyond chronological age when we're treating these kids. So these boys are the same chronological age, uh, but this boy is different physiologically than this boy. These girls are the same chronological age, but this girl is different physiologically than this girl. So when we're treating the younger patient with an ACL tear, we need to know not just what their chronological age is, <clears throat> but what their physiological age is, where they are in their growth and development. How do we get at that? We can do x-rays of their hand and wrist to determine their skeletal age. We can use a Tanner staging system to look at where they are in their pubertal status. It's important to remember that the knee in particular is very dynamic uh, with growth in, in, ch in childhood and adolescence. The majority of growth in the lower extremity is coming from the two growth plates around the knee, and there's lots of changes. There's changes in their coronal plane alignment, so genu varum, genu valgum. Um, there are changes in the rotational uh, plane alignment, so femoral antiversion and tibial torsion uh, as these kids are growing. The concern that we have when we uh, discuss ACL reconstruction in kids who are growing is the risk of growth disturbance, so ACL surgery disrupting the growth plate. And there have been some animal models that have looked at this uh, with mixed results. Some of these studies have found growth disturbances from ACL reconstruction, and others have not. Um, we reported in 2002 on 15 cases of growth disturbance from ACL reconstruction, eight cases of genu valgum or knock need uh, from a growth arrest, two cases of knock need without a growth arrest, two cases of leg length discrepancy where one leg grew longer than the other, and three cases of recurvatum or hyperextension of the knee from a growth disturbance of the tibial tubercle growth plate, the growth plate that you see involved with osgood schlatter syndrome. And when we looked at the cases, we had some recommendations, which are pretty obvious, so avoid hardware, avoid bone plugs across the growth plate, and consider modifying your technique based on the amount of growth that patients have remaining. These were two cases we saw recently of growth disturbance. This was a 14-year-old male with normal alignment that was treated elsewhere with an ACL reconstruction uh, with allograft across the growth plates. Uh, at 10 months, the graft failed, and they had valgus deformity of their knee, so they were sent to us. Uh, so here they are now at 10 months with a valgus deformity of the knee and a growth disturbance. We treated this with revision reconstruction of the ACL, 
and we stop the growth plate on the medial side of the distal femur to allow the outer side to continue to grow to correct the genu valgum, and this patient's gone on to do well. This was another case we saw, which was a 10-year-old male, so a younger child that was treated with a reconstruction across the growth plates at a very young age, at 10, and now uh, we are seeing at age 16, um, who has graft failure and a substantial deformity of their leg, so you can see how much valgus they have here of the knee. Uh, and this did have a growth disturbance of both a, a distal femur but open on the proximal tibia. Uh, and this was complex. We had to reconstruct the ACL and do an osteotomy as well. So here's our current algorithm of how we approach ACL tears in children and adolescents. I think a large group that we see are older adolescents with closing growth plates. So these are going to be females 14 and older, males 16 and older, a Tanner stage five. So they have either closed growth plates or closing growth plates without significant growth remaining. And in this population, we treat them like our adult ACL reconstruction. So we can use hamstrings or patellar tendons. We can use whatever hardware we want because the growth plates are really not so much of an issue. I think a big group that we see are adolescents. So they have hit puberty, but their growth plates are open. They have growth remaining. And in this group, we treat them with a reconstruction where we do go through the growth plates. We use their own tissue, not allografts, so we use hamstrings, and we keep our fixation away from the growth plate. So typically, we'll use an interference screw on the tibia below the growth plate and an endo button or some other technique on the femoral side above the growth plate. And we've published our results with this technique in 61 knees. The average age was 14.7, ranging from 11 to 17. Uh, and we found good results with this, a relatively low revision rate, 3%, good functional outcome and return to sports. And we saw no cases of growth disturbance by follow-up clinical and x-ray follow-up. And that's shown here. So we have an empty notch in the knee when we're doing our arthroscopic surgery. Um, we drill a tunnel here in the tibia. We're drilling a tunnel here in the femur that can either be drilled through the tibia uh, or through an accessory portal. And then there's our, our reconstructed ACL. The prepubescent child is more vexing, and we see more and more of these. I'd say we're doing surgery on a prepubescent child probably once a week now, and they're getting sent all over, from all over the place. So these are young kids, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11-year-olds. Um, so often males less than 12, females 11 or younger. Uh, and you can try rehabilitation, functional bracing. It may be a selection bias. We're seeing the ones who haven't coped with that treatment and are referred because they're having instability of their knee or they're starting to tear their meniscus or articular cartilage. What are the options in these very young patients? One option is to go through the growth plate like we do in the adolescents. Um, but remember, these kids have a lot of growth remaining. Another option is to try to drill tunnels just within the epiphysis. And this has been described by our colleagues in Tennessee and in Philadelphia. Uh, and the advantage of this is it's more anatomic. The disadvantage is you're very close to the growth plate on one side, and you're very close to the articular cartilage on the other side. We've advocated for this technique using the iliotibial band that Dr. McKaylee has described originally, where we leave the IT band intact. We bring it over the top uh, and through the knee, uh, under the intermeniscal ligament. So there's two components, an extra-articular component and an intra-articular component, and there's no drill tunnels across the growth plate. We published our results uh, with this technique in 2005, and we're uh, currently following up more patients. We had 44 patients in this study. The average age was 10. One was as young as 3 years old. We had 5-year follow-up. We had a low revision rate, two patients who needed to be revised. We had good functional outcome, and even in these very young patients, where we followed them with uh, x-rays and clinically we saw no cases of growth disturbance. And the pictures are shown here where we're isolating the IT band on the lateral side of the knee. Um, the tibia is in this direction, the femur is in this direction. We're leaving the IT band intact towards Gertie's tubercle. We bring the graft through the knee in the over-the-top position. We bring it underneath the intermeniscal ligament with a groove in the bone here to make it more anatomic. Here's the intra-articular component of the reconstruction, and we fix this down to the metaphysis of the tibia. This is what it looks like two years later when we're able to rescope this knee, and this is the appearance on MRI. Biomechanically, this technique has been uh, looked at and shows good biomechanical stability in the knee, better biomechanical stability than, uh, than other techniques that are non-anatomic or are all epiphyseal. 
So some thoughts in conclusion, I think the pediatricians will say that the child is not a little adult. And when we're treating injuries in children, we need to recognize that the child and adolescent athletes, not a little adult athlete. They're not just a downsized knee. They're different physiologically, they're different anatomically. What about our outcomes of ACL reconstruction? I think we're fairly good at restoring stability to the knee. Um, with your help with physical therapy and athletic training, we're good at restoring range of motion and strength. We get many of these kids back to sport, so I think our return to sport rate's relatively high as well. And then many of them do well in terms of their symptoms and function. What's more concerning and what we don't do as well with is their long-term outcome. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's very pessimistic when you look at the long-term outcomes of ACL reconstruction. These are three studies here. This was a prospective cohort study of 221 knees at 15-year follow-ups. ACL reconstruction alone had 62% of these knees had radiographic evidence of arthritis, and 80% of the knees, if they had ACL plus meniscus or ACL plus articular cartilage, had radiographic findings of osteoarthritis. This was a study, similar results, 79 patients, 8 to 15-year follow-up, 60% arthritis, 258 patients at 10 to 15 year follow up, 71% arthritis. And so when we pat ourselves on our back because we're restoring knee stability, range of motion, return to sports in these kids, I think we still have to be very worried about the long term health of their knee. And that brings up the importance of different ways to treat this injury, like Martha's going to talk about, and most importantly, prevention of these injuries in the first place. This is a patient after ACL reconstruction. We can see their knee now with osteoarthritis. This is a patient of mine who had ACL reconstruction at age 14, went on to some further injuries at three-year post-op. She's having some narrowing of the medial joint space. Uh, at four-year post-op, more narrowing. We had to revise her ACL reconstruction. And now at 10 years follow-up, she's got substantial arthritis of her medial compartment with spurring in the lateral compartment, loose bodies, and diffuse loss of articular cartilage. For so for the sake of our patients and the, for the sake of my kids, I think we need better ways of treating the ACL and most importantly, preventing the ACL. So thank you for your attention.